spent the last 15 years working in the field of international development, um, researching issues of poverty and food security in the global south. But it wasn't until I became vegan five years ago that I started to make the connections between our oppression of other animals, our oppression of humans, and our destruction of the natural world. Um, so I'd like to share three stories with you today, which I think illustrate these connections really nicely. My first story is about Renee Miller. Renee lives in Duplin County, North Carolina. She's a mother, she's a grandmother, she lives on the same plot of land that her grandmother lived on. Sometimes, Renee can't leave her house because the air is literally filled with shit. It makes her eyes burn, and it makes her nose run, and she says it smells like death. The smell comes from 5,000 pigs who are confined in these massive metal barns in a farm a mile from Renee's house. And you can see how horrendously cramped those conditions are. Duplin County is the hog capital of the world. It has two million pigs. That's 45 pigs for every one human. And all those pigs create a huge amount of waste, over 15,000 tons every day. And that waste gets pumped into these massive open air cesspools called lagoons. So the waste, the feces, blood, urine, other bodily fluids, and sometimes even dead pigs. There are 3,000 of these lagoons in North Carolina. And when these lagoons get full to capacity, their waste, the waste gets liquefied and sprayed onto fields. And there's a field, a, a waste field opposite Renee's house. And so when the waste gets sprayed, it covers the field and it covers her house as well. And it makes her life a misery. The vaccinations, the antibiotics, the insecticides that, that the pigs are treated with are all in this waste. So she breathes them in and she's got numerous health issues, um, asthma, heart issues, and she blames the pig waste for these. And she's not alone. Many studies link uh, animal waste from livestock farms with health, health issues um, from sore throats and seizures to coma and even death. The location of these pig farms is disproportionately located in poor communities of colour. And this pattern is known as environmental racism. And writer Lily Kuo actually summarises this whole situation really nicely. She says, the world consumes cheap bacon at the expense of North Carolina's rural poor, and I would add at the expense of the pigs' lives. At heart, it's a story about poverty and racial inequality and how the hog industry has emerged as an oppressor of poorer communities of colour. And I should say that this isn't just a pattern in North Carolina or the US, this is a pattern that occurs globally, especially as we're exporting our factory farms to um, so-called less developed countries. Now the farm that Rene lives near is a subsidiary of Smithfield Foods. Now Smithfield is a corporation that's Chinese owned and I don't know about you, but I find this quite ironic because corporate globalization has allowed richer countries like the US to export their polluting industrial processes to low income countries. And now that China is increasing in wealth, it's doing exactly the same thing to the US. Now the good news is in 2014, Rene and um, 500 other residents of North Carolina launched 26 class action lawsuits against Smithfield and so far, there have been three court cases, and in every court case, the jury has given a guilty verdict. Now, you may have heard that last month, Hurricane Florence hit North Carolina. And some of the farmers locked their animals in their cages and barns and left them to fend for themselves. 5,500 pigs died. A mind-boggling 3.4 million chickens died. Or well, I should say were killed. 37 humans were killed, and I haven't been able to find out what's happened to Rene. But to me, um, it really struck me that this whole story has come full, full circle with you know, Hurricane Florence, because it is animal agriculture that is a really significant driver of climate change, and it is climate change which is driving the surge in storms like, like Hurricane Florence. So, for me, Renee's story and 
the situation of those communities in North Carolina and the situation of those pigs confined in those farms is a really good illustration of this connection of our oppression of other animals, our oppression of humans, marginalized humans, and our destruction of the natural world. So in this case, the oppression of one devalued group, pigs, is enabled and compounded by the oppression of another devalued group, in this case, poor communities of color, and vice versa. Um, and this is something that sociologist David Nybert calls the entanglement of oppression. And all of this oppression um, is destroying our natural world. And all of this oppression and destruction is being driven by the economic interests of corporate agribusiness. So my second story is about um, someone called Chico Mendes. Now, Chico was born in 1944 in um, a rubber reserve in Western Brazil. His father was a rubber tapper, and Chico grew up in the forest, and he started tapping rubber at the age of nine. He had no formal education, and he only learned to read when he was 18 years old. Sorry, this is a picture of rubber tapping. In the 60s and 70s, uh, ranchers from southern Brazil started buying up these rubber reserves, and uh, clearing land for cattle grazing, vast amounts of land. And this was all being driven by the rise of so-called hamburger culture in the, in the States. So fast food chains like McDonald's and White Castle were being founded, and they were boosting demand with relentless advertising, and they started looking for cheap sources of cow flesh um, from Latin America. Now, this expansion of cattle ranching in the Amazon was fully supported and driven by the US government, by international institutions like the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, who loaned Latin American governments hundreds of millions of dollars worth of loans in order to expand private cattle ranching operations. And so many people were pushed off the land, dispossessed, often brutally. So, Chico, who was the president of his local workers' union at the time, so Chico and the union um, developed a non-violent resistant technique called the empate, which means standoff. And they created human barricades around the trees to stop the ranchers and the laborers from bulldozing the trees. And it was really successful, and they did this throughout the 70s and the 80s, and it caught the attention of international groups, uh, so much so that American environmentalists asked Chico to go over to America to talk to the World Bank, the IDB, um, and Congress to lobby uh, to stop this, this expansion of cattle ranching in the US, in, in, sorry, in Brazil. He won two international prizes for his efforts, but as the international support grew, so did the threat to the lives of the rubber tappers and of Chico. And as he foresaw, in 1988, he was assassinated by a rancher in his home, and he was only 44 years old. So the policies of the US in Latin America has driven this, this ridiculous situation that now 70% of agricultural land is devoted to animal agriculture to feed you know, people in wealthy countries and only produces 18% of calories. Um, it's also, animal agriculture is also strongly linked to this phenomenon of land grabbing. And when I was doing research for this talk, I realized that actually there's a term called meat grabbing. Um, because so much of the land grabbing that's happening is to do with animal agriculture. Um, and there are serious and horrible consequences of this meat grabbing. Um, and in one report called Developing the Meat Grab, uh, it says the expansion of industrial meat production on a world scale, including its voracious appetite for land and water is also the erosion of food securities and food sovereignties and an important form of dispossession concerning not only land but also relationships between people and agro-ecosystems. And all of this is contributing to the fact that nearly a billion people are living in chronic hunger at this moment. And it's all contributing to deforestation and it's estimated that 91% of Amazon destruction is caused by animal agriculture. I mean, this is 
this is just so unbelievable that Amazon, the lungs of our planet, the home to more than one in 10 species on this earth, is literally being destroyed for hamburgers. And of course, all of this is contributing to climate change and the destruction of the natural world. So, for me, again, this, this story of Shiko and the rubber tappers highlights this entanglement of oppressions. The oppression of one devalued group, in this case cows, is enabled and compounded by the oppression of another devalued group, Brazilian peasants and indigenous people, and vice versa. And all of this is contributing to the destruction of the natural world. And again, all of this is being driven by the economic interests of an elite. There's something else that I want to draw your attention to, and this is partly because of my background in international development. Um, you know, all of this was also facilitated and driven by international organizations like the World Bank, the IDB, US government. They're meant to be doing quite the opposite, or so we're told. Um, Christopher Columbus was the first person to bring cows and pigs and domesticated animals to the Americas. In my view, I think it's now Western governments, the international institutions, and corporations who are the present day colonialists. And they are per perpetuating an insidious form of neo-colonialism and under the guise of development. Um, and for those of you who've not come across the term neo-colonialism before, Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana and revolutionary wrote, the result of neo-colonialism is that foreign capital is used for the exploitation rather than for the development of the less developed parts of the world. Investment under neo-colonialism increases rather than decreases the gap between the rich and poor countries of the world. Okay, so my third story is about Bob and Luxa. Luxa was a dairy cow who um, was rescued from a farm in the UK um, and she found sanctuary at Huglet's Wood uh, Sanctuary in um, East Sussex. And this is a picture of Luxa and Bob five hours after Bob was born. And Luxa has covered him in straw um, because it was freezing cold, it was January in 1988. And they lived together until Luxa died a few years ago. And they were never separated. They were never separated the, the, the way that they would have been um, if Luxa hadn't have found, have found sanctuary. On the dairy farm, Luxa would have been forcibly impregnated over and over again through artificial insemination, using, and the farmer would have pushed her into a, a narrow trap called a cattle crush or a rape rack. And I just want to, as an aside, just draw your attention to, you know, for example, this term rape rack really points to this connection between the oppression of other animals and the oppression of women. Carol J. Adams, who um, wrote The Sexual Politics of Meat and who gave a fantastic keynote speech yesterday about the sexual politics of meat, refers to meat and, uh, sorry, refers to eggs and dairy as feminized protein. They are the products of the manipulation and abuse of the reproductive cycle of female animals. She calls it a form of sexual slavery. <laughs> she also points to how we animalize women and we, we feminize other animals and society serves them both up as consumable and I think that these, um, this slide just shows it really well. Anyway, back to the story. So on the farm, after you know, being impregnated, Luxa would have had her calves taken away from her almost immediately. Um, and she would have gone through this cycle over and over again until she was worn out. And the average dairy cow in the UK is worn out by the age of six, when the natural lifespan would be over 20. And if her calves were female, they would go back into the dairy herd and become milk machines like their mothers. And if the calves were male, like Bob, they would be no use to the dairy farmer, so they would either be sold onto a beef farm, they might be raised as veal, or they just go straight to slaughter. One way or another, Bob and Luxa would have ended up in a slaughterhouse, and that is regardless if they 
were on a factory farm or whether they were on, on, a, on an organic farm or a so-called high welfare, humane, backyard farm, they would all have, they would both have been killed. And they would have been killed by slaughterhouse workers who were most likely low-wage migrants working in really dangerous conditions. There are hundreds of, of, of injuries reported every year in the UK um, from slaughterhouse workers, like horrific injuries, like amputation of their, their limbs and crush injuries to the head. It's, it's just physically so such a dangerous occupation. But worse than the physical toll is the psychological and emotional toll. Um, most, well, many slaughterhouse workers suffer from a form of PTSD called perpetration-induced traumatic stress, the symptoms of which include depression, anxiety, panic, drug and alcohol abuse. In fact, there have been studies that show that communities with slaughterhouses have much higher crime rates, especially violent sexual crime rates, like rape, and, and also including domestic violence um, and all sorts of things. And this is something that uh, a slaughterhouse worker in America had to say. He said, the worst thing, worse than the physical danger, is the emotional toll. Pigs down on the kill floor have come up and nuzzled me like a puppy. Two minutes later, I had to kill them, beat them to death with a pipe. I can't care. So often, slaughterhouse workers are victims of the system as well. In the UK, they are often migrants from Eastern Europe with no worker protections. In the States, historically, um, they have been African American and more recently Latin American. And in Canada, this was a story from 2016, and this really, you know, really st stood out in my mind. Canadians don't want to do this work because it is so horrific. Um, and so slaughterhouses, um, they, they couldn't fill a thousand jobs. And so they lobbied the government to, to, to open up these jobs to Syrian refugees fleeing the war. Like this is, again, I, mean, I have no words for this. Okay, so... For me, this story, again, just shows another aspect of this idea of entangled oppressions. If we, if we exploit and kill other animals for our own convenience and palate pleasure, we inevitably rely on other oppressed humans to do the work that we don't want to think about and that we don't want to do. This is Bob on his 20th birthday earlier this year. Okay, so... I hope I've shown you a little bit about how possibly in reality, not a theoretical concept, but in reality how human and animal oppression and the destruction of the natural world is all connected. It was a huge aha moment for me when I started engaging in this kind of, uh, in, in this. It really, really opened my eyes um, to how the world actually works and, and how oppression works. Um, and the logical conclusion of this is that if our oppression is connected and entangled, then so is the liberation of other animals, marginalised human, and the planet. If, if you take away only one thing, this is what I would like you to take away, that it's all connected. Okay, so now the problem is just much, more big, much bigger than we originally thought. What are we meant to do about it? Um, how can we, as individuals, make any dent in such a massive system that is so unjust? Um, and I, I don't have all the answers. I really wish I did. This is a question I ask myself every day. Um, but what I do have is some suggestions and ideas and insights that I have gathered over the last five years since I went vegan and started reading and thinking and really reflecting on these things. So, if... Well, at the risk of stating the obvious, if we want um, to end animal exploitation, if we want to achieve animal liberation, we have to stop participating in the violence. And to me, that means going vegan. If we believe that other animals... Um, are, no, let me start again. If we believe that it's morally wrong to cause unnecessary suffering to other sentient beings, we already believe in veganism. Species is no more relevant a criteria to exclude someone from the moral community than is sex, race, class, um, ability, sexual orientation, any of those things. To do so is to be speciesist. 
but it's not enough. And as soon after I went vegan, I realized that so many of the products that I was consuming were not truly cruelty-free. They might not include animal products, but what about the effect on humans and the environment? And I'm talking about products like vegan chocolate. Okay, so it might not contain cow's milk, but what if it's been produced using child slaves in West Africa? And what about our very righteous, beautiful vegan t-shirts? How many of them have been produced with sweatshop labour in the Global South? Okay, and what about our food, our non-organic plant foods, either processed or whole? How much of that has been produced through conventional industrial agriculture methods, um, using agrochemicals and ploughing the soil and destroying the soil, poisoning free-living animals, um, you know, polluting our waterways, um, killing field animals like mice and voles. I mean, is that cruelty-free? And not to even mention that the exploitation of farm workers. Okay, so fine, what about organic fruits and veg? Well, a lot of manure from organic agriculture actually comes from animal agriculture. Things like blood and bone meal. And if it's produced by ploughing the soil, that is also not sustainable. So it's a minefield. Um, and I don't know what the answer really is, but it, it sort of led me to start being more mindful about my consumption choices and to think not just about, um, you know, the effects on other animals, but also to humans and the environment, um, which, you know, leads us to the world of ethical consumption. But even that's not very satisfying because, I mean, we buy things with labels of fair trade and organic and, and vegan. Um, so often we're giving our money back straight back to the same corporations that are actually causing so much of the injustice which is happening, at least in my view. Um, and how accessible is it? Because, you know, it takes me a long time to research products and, and it's expensive. It's not accessible to most people. And then I started to think, well, if I'm reducing my veganism and my ethics to individual consumption choices, I'm reinforcing this false belief that we can vote with our dollars, or rather our ethical vegan pounds, and we can somehow consume our way to moral progress and political change. We can't. So, I've come to the conclusion that really we need to be consuming as little as possible because all of it causes some kind of suffering. Um, and what we do need to consume needs to be sourced as ethically as we can. Um, there is one thing, though, that I would highlight, and that is if we can support, workforce, set up businesses and organisations which provide us with an alternative to the corporate capitalist you know, mode of production, organisations and businesses like worker-owned cooperatives, social enterprises, collectives, then I think we can start shifting away from a kind of reformist to a more radical change. Okay. But it's not all about consumption. Um, and when we start thinking about oppression and the, the effects that we have in the world and wanting to reduce the suffering that we cause, you know, I started looking at, you know, the other ways that I oppress others through my behaviour, through my language, through the unconscious beliefs, beliefs that I've internalised, that we've all internalised because we live in an unequal and oppressive society. Um, and if we believe that all oppression is connected, that means we have to challenge the whole hierarchy of oppression. And that means that it's not enough to be anti-speciesist. We also have to be anti all other oppressions. It's all connected. They all reinforce each other. So that means that we have to be consistent in our anti-oppression stances. We're anti-speciesist, but also anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti all the other you know, isms. Um, and a really great place to start, if this is a new concept for you, is this book edited by Julia Feliz. I make a cameo appearance in the last chapter, but it's very small. Um, but it's a, it's a really good introduction to these, these ideas. So all of this, veganism, ethical consumption, uh, consistent anti-oppression, basically lead, led me, anyway, to embracing this idea of political veganism, which animal rights philosopher Robert C. Jones um, coined the term and wrote a really nice paper called Veganism looking at the different types of veganism, identity veganism um, and political veganism. And he says, 
Political veganism is limited not only to a rejection of the consumption of animal products, but also a rejection of the structures and institutions that link the commodification and exploitation of animals, vulnerable human populations, and the environment. It is not a personal dietary lifestyle choice, but rather an active and engaged worldview dedicated to an inclusion of non-human animals in social justice theory and practice. So, he also says that political veganism is an aspiration. It's a goal to strive for. It's not an identity, and it's not really about us. It's about what we're working towards. Now, these are all really nice words, um, but what does it even mean to reject structures of oppression. Um, to me, this means rejecting, okay, so structural, you know, rejecting structures, uh, you know, like oppressive um, laws and policies. So we're talking about changing, um, let's say, the legal status of other animals from property to person. This is not something that can be done through individual change. It cannot be done through individual consumption choices. It is something that requires something stronger, something powerful, like a social movement. And I'm not talking about you know, a social movement for veganism. I'm talking about a social movement for animal liberation. That's two different things. So we need a powerful social movement that can actually change people's minds, transform consciousness, and actually build the social power to demand structural change. So for me, this means, if we're thinking about all of the things that I've talked about, the interconnectedness of oppression, um, the fact that we need to build the power to, you know, to demand structural change, I think that we need to build a social movement for animal liberation and not a vegan movement, an anti-speciesist movement which centers other animals because veganism centers humans. Um, it's not about us and our consumption choices. This is a movement for other animals. So I'm talking about a movement that centers other animals as the actors in their own liberation and that can build the power to demand the structural change that we need. And that requires participation because we can't have powerful social movements without public participation. And in fact, um, there's been some really good research done recently that shows that, that looked at 300 um, campaigns over the last 100 years and found that those campaigns that were able to have the active and sustained participation of 3.5% of the population, and sometimes even less, were successful. <laughs> That's 2.3 million people in the UK. And active participa participation can mean anything from advocating to friends and family, um, advocating online, leafleting, vegan outreach, lobbying local councillors, all the way to non-violent direct action like sit-ins, protests, strikes, boycotts, open rescue. They are all needed. They are all useful and, and necessary contributions. And there is a whole literature on civil resistance, which I've only just started scratching the surface of, but it is so inspiring to think, of, it tells you what's possible. Um, and a really good place to start, if this is of interest to you, is this fantastic book called This Is An Uprising by the Angular Brothers. And um, a, a shameless plug here, but if um, any of this interests you, I'm a co-founder of a collective called Animal Think Tank, and we are working on developing and sharing knowledge um, from based on you know past and present social movements on building an inclusive and strategic movement for animal liberation and um, if anybody is interested in, in this they can give me their email address and I, I'll add you to the mailing list I'll, I'll pass around to oh Dan might uh, another one of the co-founders of Animal Think Tank will, will um, pass around a sheet okay so I don't know what the Pretty good timing. Um, does it, before I um, wrap up with my last slide, does anyone have any questions? Amazing. I was scared about this. Oh, okay. I think we're all stunned. Really? This is 
to me a really powerful quote by Frederick Douglass, who was a um, slavery abolitionist. Um, in 1857, he wrote, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. We need to build a mass movement for animal liberation. And if ordinary people like me and like you don't take action, the violence against other animals will never end. Thank you.